welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I think we'll just get started now. Um, so first with introductions, my name's Zona. I'm part of the Ophthalmology Society at the University of Manchester. I'm the phase two rep. My name is Astrid. I'm also part of the Ophthalmological Society and I'm the Duke Elder Rep. Hi, my name is Salaha. I'm the Integrating Student and I'm the President of EMOS. Um, so before I hand over to Ali Mirza, who's going to be talking about his career today, um, just a couple of things to note. Um, feel free to turn your cameras on. It'd be nice to see your faces. Um, and then we'll do a QA and a at the end. And for that, you can either unmute yourselves or put questions in the chat. Um, so I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Sona. So uh, yeah, many thanks for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, talking to you about uh, my career in ophthalmology, uh, hoping to inspire the next generation uh, with my story. So uh, let's go. So basically, what I'm going to this is the outline. So I'm going to start off with how it all started and why eyes. Then I'll talk a little bit about my training as a joint registrar, and a little bit about subspecialty training, and then life as a consultant. Uh, what that what that looks like. I'll give you some examples of setting up a service, um, the clinical director role I did, as well as, uh, as a little bit of insight into uh, private practice and how we set up OCL vision. And then I'll, obviously throughout I'll pepper it with career highlights to try and give you a flavor of uh, what you're getting into. So background, I, I was born in Baghdad. That's me there. That's my mom and dad. I was born there um, and then came over to the UK at the age of one. I was in boarding school from 11. Um, Mum wanted to, me to be a doctor. It's a classical Middle Eastern thing. I want you to be a doctor. Um, if you love me, that's what you need to do. Um, so, you know, I was good at the sciences. So I thought, okay, you know, I'll give it a go. That was my sort of um, motivation. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try and get into medical school. So I managed to get into medical school. That's me as a medical student. I went to Charing Cross Westminster, now known as Imperial. So back then you didn't have to do a intercalated BSc. You could get away with just doing five years. I think now mostly it's six years. So I did that. Um, then I did house jobs. So I did six months in respiratory medicine, six months in general surgery and urology. Uh, back in those days, it was like 120 hour week, uh, long hours punishing on calls. And actually, I was a bit demoralized, to be honest, with uh, where I was. Um, just because you think you do all this study and then you get to a point where you think, oh, is this really going to be my life? Am I really happy with this? So it was a bit of a dilemma. At the time, I did enjoy watching, there was a program called ER or Emergency Room. Uh, I used to watch that quite a bit. It was an American sitcom uh, series about emergency medicine. Um, in fact, it launched George Clooney's career. There he, there he is there. So there, you know, that looks pretty exciting. Let me give casualty a go. So that was my sort of decision. So I did an A&E job at, at Charing Cross and the Hammersmith. I was pretty good. It was quite interesting. The trauma was amazing. Uh, but after a while, the shift work took its toll. So you'd be, you'd be doing weeks potentially of like 10, till 10 at night to 8 in the morning, a week of that. Or it could be 12 midday to 12 midnight, that kind of thing. And I just thought, I just looked at myself. I said, do I really want to be doing this in my 40s and 50s? That was the kind of thinking I had. Um, and then as during that point, I took an interest in eyes. I liked the fact that it was quite visual. You can see the problem. So in casualty, you'd often see things like this. This is a subconjunctival hemorrhage from some trauma. This is like a metal foreign body. Uh, this is a, a, what's called an arida dialysis, where the iris root comes away from the edge. You know, and I just thought, you know what, that's quite nice. I don't have to order loads of blood tests. Um, I can quickly get to the diagnosis from a bit of history as you're looking at the patient. And whenever I referred the patient to the ophthalmologist, it was always very, very positive. You know, they would say, you know, that sounds pretty good. Send it to me in the morning, I'll take a look. I was like, in the morning? Okay, that's, that's pretty good. I want to be on the end of that phone call. You know, whereas if you're referring on to medics, surgeons, it's always a bit of a, always a bit of a, dry, a, a drama and they're often not that happy to take the patients in. So the decision was made to do ophthalmology. This is an example of a, of a dense cataract as well. It's very visual. I uh, diagnosed the problem. So it was a bit of a struggle to get in. I mean, eyes are, as you know, super competitive. Um, I tried to get a, an eye job somewhere. I couldn't get a job 
anywhere. So I uh, was unemployed for a couple of months after a &E. So But what I did do is bulked up the CV. I did a couple of Y courses. I did the part one I exam, which you could do those days before getting an eye job. And then in 98, I got my first eye job in Bournemouth. Uh, did that for nine months. And then I got onto uh, a senior house of rotation at the World Free Hospital in Hampstead, which was a two year thing. Uh, so back in those days, you, it was separated. You didn't have run through training. So you had to do what's called SHO training for a couple of years. You had to get some of your exams and then you could apply to registrar training. And then so there was a, there was a sort of um, a competitive interview process to get into registrar training. But anyway, I managed to get into the Southwest Thames registrar rotation, um, which is for four years. Um, the highlight of which was now to program experience in Australia, There's a lot of opportunity to travel in ophthalmology. I had a letter one day from an ophthalmologist in, um, in uh, Australia saying, do you fancy doing a swap? I'll do your job in the UK and you can do my job in Australia. So, okay, that sounds pretty good. So I did that. So that's called an after program experience. I would strongly encourage you guys to think about doing that kind of thing if possible. So off I went to Australia and it was an amazing experience. I did three months in Sydney. There's the Harbour Bridge. There's the Opera House. That's Bondi Beach. That's me back in the day. I had a bit more hair back then. Uh, that's your eye clinic, classic at Christmas. So I did three months in Sydney. Uh, and then the other part of the rotation was three months in a place called Broken Hill, which is uh, in the, literally the middle of nowhere in the outback. You had to take a propeller plane uh, to get there. Um, that was quite an experience. And it literally is in the middle of nowhere. Um, there you go, like literally bounds of red desert. Uh, that's the town of Broken Hill in the background. There you go. And there was one hospital and there was about 25,000 people in the in the town and you're the only ophthalmologist there so that's me there this is occasionally you get a visiting ophthalmologist coming in from sydney or melbourne so this guy was called uh, dick garbray he was a nice guy but yeah mostly on your own 24 7 serving the whole community so it was quite quite interesting they filmed a lot of mad max there i don't know if uh, you guys are probably too young but mad max was a, a an amazing movie back in the uh, the 80s that the mad max car was still there that's me on it. Interesting, the, uh, the handbrake wasn't on. So I sat in the car and it started rolling backwards. The person I was with was just snapping away <laughs> instead of going inside to get some help. Like, can you go and get some help? Anyway, so we managed to get it into position. The other thing about Australia is the great uh, coastline. You've got to travel and just explore the beautiful beaches. I learned to surf out there. Okay, it's a small wave, but it's still a wave. Um, Technically, it was a, you, know, you do learn stuff. They have a big problem with pterygium over there. That's a growth of conjunctival tissue onto the cornea. And there are several ways to remove it. Um, and they, they, they've sort of mastered that because they get so many. So that, that was quite a good technique to learn while I was out there. So anyway, so I came back, uh, finished up my registrar training, attained all the professional exams. And then in eyes, there are seven subspecialties within eyes. So you think the eye is just a small little thing, but actually super complex. You can subspecialize in cornea, the front of the eye. You can specialize in the back of the eye, medical retina, surgical retina. You can specialize in glaucoma, pediatric ophthalmology, ocular plastics, and so on. So you have to make a decision towards the end of your training about what bit of the eye you want to specialize in, subspecialize in. So for me, it was always cornea. This is an example of a corneal transplant. And I remember watching, uh, in my first slide of watching my consultant put in these stitches, uh, literally 10 or nylon under the microscope for a graft. And that just inspired me that, okay, that is just awesome. That's what I want to do. And I never really deterred from cornea throughout my training. So I had a year's fellowship at uh, Moorfields, at St. George's, where they teach you corneal transplant techniques, things like that. And then I went abroad and I did a laser refractive surgery fellowship on the island of Crete. So there I am there with my boss, Yaris Aslanidis. This was the outgoing fellow with his wife and child. So yeah, the, the thing with laser refractive is laser, laser eye surgery is quite an important component of cornea. And no one really gonna, is going to teach you teach, teach it to you in the UK. So you do have to go abroad for that experience. Um, and that was an incredible experience in Crete. So I did that for a year. That was my certificate, finished in 2007. And then I was looking for consultant jobs. So I managed to get a local consultant job at the Wall Free, where I did my SHO training. Many of my old consultants were still there. 
And then there was an opportunity at Imperial and I managed to get a substantive consultant job there in September, 2007, so that's 15 years ago now. So what's life like as a consultant? Well, it's pretty daunting when you first start, but it's also very exciting. You're setting up a new service, uh, always setting up a new Cornell service. You got a bid for equipment, you're bringing new techniques to the trust that haven't been there. So you're really helping patients out with visual rehabilitation, bringing improvements to what's already there. There's also opportunities for clinical leadership. Uh, I did the clinical director role from 2016 to 2021, that's five years. And then as a consultant, there's opportunities for private practice. Uh, that eventually led to the setup of OCL vision, which I'll come on to later. Let's talk a little bit about the clinical director role. So after nine years of being a consultant, there was an opportunity came up to apply for the clinical director role as part of a trust restructure. Um, there were basically significant challenges within our department that was highlighted. And the division wanted to address some of the things that were, we were facing with, with a series of never events. So these are events that shouldn't really happen. We had three of them the preceding 18 months, quite a few uh, serious incidents as well. We had issues with governance, meeting structures needed improvements. There were poor uptake of trust initiatives. Uh, we as a service were isolated from the main trust. Uh, the trainees were unhappy. Uh, there were poor admin and managerial support. And the medical director's office at the time asked the college to do an external review, which they did. Um, so anyway, they encouraged me to apply. I applied for the job uh, after lots of encouragement from colleagues. So I was appointed as CD in 2016, along with a new management team. And then, uh, you know, no one really gives you leadership training. That's something you do have to uh, learn as you go along. Obviously, I read a couple of books, did a couple of courses, but there are general changes you can make which can make a difference. Some of the basic things are just responding to emails in a timely manner, setting up action logs as well as minutes for meetings with accountable personnel for each. I like to involve trainees in all the processes because I just found they're really innovative. They're great ideas. And if you involve them, often, they, they're kind of vested to improve the service with all of us. So that was quite good. We, re, we recalibrated expectations and then we expand a lot of leadership roles within the department. So that, that was like what our team at Imperial looked like. That was um, the general manager, that's myself, and then we had a senior nurse. And then we had all these uh, people underneath in various roles, which really transformed the service. What did we achieve? Well, the biggest thing, I suppose, is we went paperless. So we were using paper all the time. So we were the first department in the trust to go paperless. We were an exemplar. So that was really good to, to achieve that. We appointed 10 consultants from that over that five year period, bought new equipment, et cetera. And I actually got involved in a fair bit of research as well. What was the biggest challenge? Well, COVID was the biggest problem we were faced with. I suppose everyone faced it at the time. So we all know it broke out in Wuhan, China, 2019, worldwide spread, basically spread everywhere. It was a nightmare all around. The main issue being the, uh, the uh, demand on critical care beds, which in turn causes a cascade of problems. I mean, as a department, we had to ramp down activity, still look after our urgent emergency patients. We had reduced staff for various reasons. We had to change a lot of our pathways. We had to go to team Zoom meetings. And then once restrictions eased, then we had to ramp things up again. And of course, you're dealing with uh, people with a significant, have a significant backlog of care to manage. And there are several cycles of that, down, up, et cetera. And there were developments occurring all the time. So, you know, it's important to keep up with communication as departments who were daily updates to everybody. So that did take its toll. I also got COVID myself, but managed to get, get through it. What it teaches you, uh, NHS leadership, and just working in the NHS in general, is basically to get things done, uh, you need the three Ps, positivity, persistence, and patience. That's your sort of take home things for getting things done in the NHS, uh, as you'll find when you start working in it. Other career highlights and reason to do wise. Uh, one of the things I really enjoyed um, during my training and as a consultant was, was the charitable eye work. So there are huge opportunities for charitable work around the, the world, particularly uh, cataract surgery. So this is a group of us who went to Ghana. Uh, that was one of the first trips we went on. Uh, that's me uh, operating in an environment with a whole lot of audience. Um, so we're dealing with really bad cataracts, people who can't see 
HM stands for hand movements, PL stands for perception of light. So you're dealing with people who are clinically blind. And the reason is you, they've got these kind of rocks in their eye that there's no one to do the surgery for them. And they basically, if you leave a cataract for too long, it develops to such a point that the patients are effectively blind. Um, so it's very rewarding to do that kind of work. You know, you get them from perception of light vision to, you know, they're seeing pretty much the driving standard of vision. And just as a person is really sort of um, good for the heart to do. Um, this is just an example of the people uh, we've helped. Also fosters teamwork, really good to get involved with the local teams. Um, a lot of these individuals we go out with, uh, some of these are trainees, they're all now consultants, uh, which is, which is all, all great to see. Uh, one of the highlights uh, of these charitable trips was a trip to Bali. So there I was teaching cataract surgery. There's another example of a patient with a cataract, you see the white reflex in their eye. Difficult sometimes because the kit can be quite poor, uh, but also it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's challenging, but it's, uh, it's also quite rewarding. The interesting thing about this trip was while I was on the island, um, there was an elephant park up in the hills and they heard that a Western ophthalmologist was in Bali and they, um, they wanted someone to come and have a look at what, a special patient of theirs. And they offered to give me a, a helicopter ride to go and see them. So I was like, okay, I get a tour of the island, why not, let's go. So there we go, that's, that's a picture of Bali. And this is the patient. So basically it was an elephant who uh, couldn't see out of one of their eyes, the mahouts on top of the elephant. When they did the signaling, when you did it to the left, the elephant would turn, when you did it to the right, it wouldn't turn. And they wondered what was going on there and wanted an ophthalmologist to have a look at it. I'm no, I'm no veterinary ophthalmologist. I'm trying to look at this elephant and there's this flapping ear going on. And there I am like, trying to hold its eyelid open and looking with, with the torch. Uh, and then I look at the other eye, I, think, mm, I don't know, I can't see anything. What would I do if this is a human patient? I know, I'll put some drops in, I'll put some dilating drops in. So I had some drops with him, put some drops in, had a beer with the owner, came back and had a look and there you go, look, the elephant has a cataract there in one of his eyes. And that's the reason why they couldn't see. This is quite interesting. So elephants don't have tear ducts. They, um, they just have tears dripping down their, their, uh, their face, which just evaporates. Anyway, the elephant went on and had um, cataract surgery and uh, did very well. Um, other opportunities for travel, uh, you get to go to lots of meetings. This is me in Argentina, just talking about uh, corneal graft surgery. It was an invite I had uh, just before COVID actually, 25th of October, 2019. Obviously, when you're there, you take the opportunity to uh, see the homeland of Maradona and Messi. And then I do recommend the, the steak and the Malbec wine. Uh, incredible out there, if you do get to go. Uh, what does my typical week uh, look like? So I have four or five clinics a week. I do two to three operating sessions a week. One admin day, I'm on call one in 10. And on call weekends, two to three per year. And it's very rare to be called in uh, in ophthalmology. It's one of the appeals of doing it. So you don't have to be uh, in-house, you can be on call from home. And most things in eyes can wait till the next day. Um, so surgery is great. You, know, you get opportunities for microsurgery, um, cataract lens surgeries is sort of a bread and butter for most ophthalmologists. If you subspecialize in cornea, what I do, you get corneal transplantation. And then there's trauma, eye reconstruction, and laser vision correction is another thing I, I do privately. I was going to give you an example of some of the surgery that I do. So uh, some of it's quite interesting. This was a patient who had significant trauma, felt something going in their eye. And we sewed up the cornea here. And then you see there's a sort of reflex of something. And we, we take it out. And it actually turned out to be a seven millimeter splinter of wood that was in their eye. So that was uh, probably one of the most interesting cases we were, we were faced with. Um, so you get to do that kind of thing. It was so interesting that we got approached by the Discovery Channel uh, who heard about it. And they did a special feature uh, in their program called Body Invaders. If anyone wants to see it, it's on my YouTube channel, just highlighting the story of this individual. Uh, this is another uh, trauma case. I'll just go through this, it's quite interesting. So this patient felt something going in their eye and that's a remnant, again, of a piece of wood that had gone in in this area here. There I was putting a dye. This is the lens we're looking at here with the ruptured lens capsule. That's the opening where the foreign object had entered. So I'm just giving it a bit of a wash. And then what we do here, I'm putting a stitch in to uh, close the wound because it was leaking. So 
and burying the knot there. So once the stitch is in place, we then move on to the lens aspect. The pupil here is dilated, so you can see the edge of the iris there. Here I'm making a little opening in the lens capsule, um, which is not straightforward because it's, it's traumatically damaged. And then we apply a bit of fluid to free up the main lens content. Uh, here what I'm doing is aspirating that lens, so I'm removing it. It's gone cloudy because of the trauma. You can see the red reflex now coming through. And if you leave an eye without a lens, they don't see. So here we're putting in an artificial uh, lens, putting it in position, taking out the sort of jelly supporting substance, and then putting in a little stitch and that completes the procedure. This is a dye just to ensure there are no leaks, but this patient had his vision restored back to 2020. So that's really a rewarding thing to do. Um, you get faced with weird stuff over the years. This is um, something called an artificial iris. And this is something that it's not CE marked, not approved in the US or the UK or Europe for that matter. But some people are desperate to change the color of their eyes and they will go to great lengths to do so. So there are these lenses available uh, in countries like India, uh, North Africa, they're unlicensed, they're not recommended, but people pay a lot of money to go off and have these lenses put in their eye. I mean, they don't look particularly great to me, but anyway, uh, they do create lots of problems. And I ended up removing quite a lot of them uh, over the years. So much so that I ended up creating a, a method, a technique of removing them called the tab technique, uh, which we published and was also on my YouTube channel. So what we do, we enter the eye, we make a little incision in these implants, like so. And then you see me grabbing this thing here. There we go, we're gonna grab it. And then literally we just pull it out. There we go, out it comes. That's the natural eye color underneath. And this is the, the artificial iris. And look at these spikes here. These patients end up with all sorts of problems. Um, yeah. That's interesting. This is, lady is quite interesting. Um, this She was in a nightclub in Mayfair and uh, they were taking pictures with wild animals, including snakes. So she had a picture taken and as soon as the flash went, the snake bit her in the eye. Uh, you can see the snake being thrown off into the nightclub. It's just writhing around on the nightclub floor. You can imagine the scene, screams, etc. And she's there with her eye uh, in agony. And so she comes to us to the casualty at the Western Eye Hospital. Here you see blood within the eye subconjunctival hemorrhage. And then on high mag, you see this is where the, the teeth of the snake had bitter within the cornea. So this was a leaking wound. We had to take it to theater and stitch this up. Thankfully, she did very well and restored her vision. But it's the kind of strange thing you see. Uh, so you ended up in the, in the paper. The paper somehow got the story. So this is her. You can see some of the scars there. Scars of a woman who was bitten in the eye by a python. Um, the lady who went to change her eye color, the first one I saw, she also made the paper. She was in that Daily Mail, uh, paid 8,000 pounds. to I think in Mexico, Central America, she went to, to have those things put in. And then we end up fixing it on the NHS, as you do. Um, the other aspect of my job is, is the private work. So we, this is a, the laser suite at OCL Vision. And this is really a really enjoyable aspect doing laser vision correction. The, the feeling when you when patients see things when they're out of their glasses for the first time, pretty incredible. This is a lady who just had it. I just put a volume down. So I'm about to look at the clock. As you can see it, she's like, wow, that's amazing. Boom. Yeah, so that's really rewarding. Um, the other thing you get to see is, is uh, hang out with famous, or see and treat famous individuals. This is Les Ferdinand, used to play for Spurs in Newcastle, so England, ex-football player. And this is the late, great uh, Professor Hawking. Uh, it was an incredible experience to, to meet him. Um, so I'm going to now talk about the OCL vision journey. So this is, um, talk a lot about NHS stuff. So this is um, basically the private side of things. Uh, as a consultant, obviously you do your NHS work, but there is an opportunity to, to do private work. And as you um, progress, um, uh, if you if you're any good, if you're any good, you get busier very you get busy very quickly. Um, so um, an opportunity came up uh, along with my colleagues. That's Ramesh and Ganavella, who I knew through training. Alan Barsam also knew through training. He was one of my fellows, uh, very good. Um, so we sort of decided to join forces. It was always in the back of our minds to have our own clinic. It's not something easily done, 
but we had the plan. Um, we joined forces with uh, Juliet, who is a credible operational uh, manager. And uh, we found a premises. So this is our premises on 55 New Cavendish Street between Harley Street and Wimble Street. So that's an impressive building. Um, so there's Juliet with the keys um, when we first got it, got the lease. And then basically we did a whole design job, um, designed it as we liked, put the environment in the, that we wish to put in to make it a, an enjoyable uh, space for patients. That's what it looks like, typical diagnostic room, typical consultation room. This is me down in the laser room. So this is where we were planning where to do our laser eye surgery. That's me and the channel. Okay, we're gonna have the bed there. We're gonna have one laser there, one laser there. That was literally just mapping it out with cardboard on the floor. You've got to have the vision for these things. There it comes together and there's the laser suite there. So, you know, from that aspect to this, uh, it was just an incredible process. That's us at the opening um, party. Uh, I'm just taking out the standard selfie. Um, so talk a little bit about this slide here. So a lot of people will just see this aspect. They say, oh, these guys have just done it. It's amazing, it's an easy thing to do. But you know, what people don't see is what it takes uh, to be successful. What does it take? The dedication, the hard work, the habits, the disappointment you have to face, the sacrifice, the failure you've got to deal with, uh, the persistence, you just got to keep up with things and eventually you do get the reward. So I, I quite like this, the iceberg illusion slide. Uh, works for most things in life. Easy to look at the success, but a lot of people just forget what it takes to get there in any field, really. So just to summarize, I mean, ophthalmology is an incredible career choice. It is competitive, uh, but also extremely rewarding. It does have a great combination of medicine and surgery. That's a uniqueness about it. So the medicine with eyes is really interesting, but then you get the surgical aspect as well. And, you know, you don't have to do what I did. You could do ocular plastics. So if you like eyelids, you can do that. You can do glaucoma surgery, retinal surgery. There's many different aspects you can get into with eyes in terms of the surgery. There are a lot of opportunities for charitable work. I've done about seven to eight trips. I've been to India, Ghana, Madagascar, Burma, Bali. Uh, that's an incredible thing to do to help individuals around the world. There's lots of opportunities to travel. There's meetings all the time, various places around the world. Um, it gives you a good work-life balance. So, you know, when you're on call, you're, you're at home. Uh, the hours are pretty reasonable. You know, you're not dealing with uh, a lot of trauma. It's, uh, it works for a lot of people. I would, I would say that um, you don't get a lot of exposure to it as a medical student. So you do need a bit of faith to go into it. When you do go into eyes, there is a lot of basic science to learn beforehand. So you would learn you know, ocular anatomy, ocular biochemistry, ocular physiology, ocular embryology. And uh, then once you understand that, then you can understand the ocular pathology. Um, but it is incredible. You learn a lot um, during your first year or two. Uh, a lot of it's basic, but it's, and then the other thing you're learning is how to use all the kit. So don't be too disillusioned if you, for example, can't use an ophthalmoscope. We hardly ever use ophthalmoscopes in ophthalmology, uh, funnily enough, even though. <laughs> It's like your, your standard bit of kit as a medical student, we, we hardly ever use it. We use something called the 90D lens or various other lenses to look at the back of the eye. Uh, it gives you a better view. Yeah, so don't be disillusioned if you can't use an ophthalmoscope. Uh, we teach you all the, all the stuff you need to learn on the job. Um, and it's a great specialty. I mean, for me personally, I was at a real uh, crossroads, not knowing what to do, got very demoralized. But once I got into eyes, I never looked back. I just shifted gears and that was the best thing I ever did. And I'm just, yeah, I think it's an incredible career. And I hope this talk inspires a couple of, couple of you, if not all of you, to go into it. Uh, thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. One stop sharing. There we go. Thank you very much. That was so interesting. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can pop them in the chat or you can unmute yourselves. Oh, question. <laughs> um, so you're out of program experience in Australia. How did you hear about it? Yeah, I got a, I got a letter from a uh, colleague, uh, from a, a doctor out in Australia. She just dropped a letter to one of the consultants hoping for oh, some right. interest. So she just said, look, does anyone out there want to do a swap? And I think what it transpired, she didn't want to do her broken heel bit. 
you know, being the ophthalmologist on your own in a town of 25,000 people. Yeah. But also she wanted to travel in and around Europe. Mm. So she wanted to just experience that, uh, experience, you know, in the UK. And mm. then, uh, then so to, to affect that, you got to then write to the deanery. You then know, so like, well, you know, this is what your timetable is going to be. This is the mm. experience you're going to get. Then you've got to get approval. You're going to plan it out. Then you're going to work out where you're staying. So it mm. does take a lot of organizing, but it's de definitely worth it if you can do it. Mm. Uh, I still have friends there to this day, and I've been back you know, quite a few times. I actually came close to taking a job out in Australia, an opportunity to uh, work out in Brisbane. Um, but then the job at Imperial came out at the same time, so I ended up taking the Imperial job. But uh, yeah, I would recommend it uh, if you can do an average program experience. It is definitely, you know, definitely worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> there's, a, there's a question in, in the chat. Um, what sort of things can we do as medical students to get a head start, buff up our CVs for ophthalmology? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, one of the things to do is that there's the, there is the Duke Elder exam, eye exam. Uh, so if you get a chance to do that, do that. And that helps you. I mean, you, you need to study a little bit for it so you get a little bit of idea of what you're getting into. So that's quite good to do. And uh, there may be some eye, basic eye courses that the Royal College of Ophthalmologists run. Probably worth looking into that. Basically, what you want to show if you want to do eyes is that you're interested in eyes. Um, if there are elective opportunities, I think you still have an opportunity to go on elective. You could do that, and you know, with some ophthalmology uh, experience there, get some get some input from that. So that's quite good to do. Um, yeah, so basically, just looking at all angles to show your your interest and in your own time. You could see if you can shadow some eye clinics, learn how to use a slit lamp. You know, basically, you just want to bulk up that CV and put put things on it. You know, and the other thing you could do is you know, just. Get interested in it. Look at the YouTube channels, see what eye surgery is about, learn about the anatomy, etc. So obviously you've got to get through your medical training, but yeah, you just got to try and work out what things you can put in your CV to make yourself competitive or more competitive. Mm. All right. And oh, sorry, there's another question. Um, what are your thoughts on medical ophthalmology? Yeah, so if, that, if medical ophthalmology, if that, if that means ophthalmology without surgery, uh, I suppose that's that's the question. Um, that's fine as well. I mean, there is, a, there is a space for that. There are plenty of people who do the ophthalmology side of things, the medical side of things, the diagnostics without the surgical component. You don't have to do the surgery. I mean, during the training, you do get exposed to the surgery, but not everyone is a natural surgeon. So, you know, you're going to, what, what you don't know is um, how are you going to be? during surgery you know, we we don't i mean i didn't know i was going to be a, a good surgeon you guys don't know you know you kind of hope that when you get there you can do it but um it's like everything else there's a bell-shaped curve you're going to have a lot of average you're going to have exceptional and you're going to have people who can't who can't do surgery for whatever reason um i suppose uh, the difficulty is working out having the insight to know where you are and then gear your career accordingly just accept that you know uh, there are more um surgical subspecialties compared to others. So you can, the other beauty of ophthalmology, you can decide what area you want to go into. Mm -hmm. Another question just popped up uh, from Malik. He says, hi, Mr. Mirza, I'm a fan of your Instagram vids and edits. Um, what are your thoughts of Optal training in the UK versus USA? Okay, yeah, good, good. Thank, thank you for looking at my stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, the Instagram and the, uh, all that edits, yeah, I quite like all that. I'm on TikTok as well. It's, um, I love all that creative side. Um, and it does allow you to bring in a bit of humor uh, to two things and you know, help people learn that way. But yeah, what are my thoughts on training off down in the UK versus USA? I mean, in the UK, you're going to get more surgical exposure for sure. Uh, at the moment, in, in the USA, you don't get as much surgery. So you, I would say on average, you'd finish your USA training with about maybe 100 the 200 cataracts if you're lucky. Whereas in the UK at the moment, you're getting about two to 300. When I finished, I've done a thousand cataracts in my training before I even took up a consultant job. I think that's being squeezed on a little bit now, but you're still better off here in terms of the, um, the surgical numbers. They've also reduced the training a little bit. You know, you've got the run-through training now, which is, I understand, seven years. 
uh, which is probably about right, to be honest. And then you've got the opportunity for fellowship training to really uh, hone your skills and decide what subspecialty you want to do. I've got the chat here, actually. I can go to this. And someone said to get consultant post, is PhD quite common prerequisite these days? I would say no, not really. Um, you know, people assume that to get a teaching hospital post, you need a BSc, MD, this and that. But yeah, it helps. It helps you get shortlisted, but it's not the be-all and end-all. I mean, my example, personally, I didn't do a BSc in medical school. At the point I did it, I had a choice, and I decided that actually I just wanted to go on and be, do, do I love the clinical side. So I didn't do one. Um, I didn't do an MD. But what I did do is lots of um, clinical research. So I published a lot. I started off with case reports, then case series, any opportunity I can, even an audit, I kind of turned into a public publication. So I went to that imperial interview with uh, over 20 publications. Now I was competing with people with MDs, PhDs, and all sorts, but they didn't have as many publications as I did. And I didn't even have a formal research degree. But by having, having those publications, it does allow you to get on the shortlist, and then it's about then it's about the interview, isn't it? One would hope. So, you know, at, in Imperial, I was I was up against six other candidates. We had to do a presentation. Thankfully, I went through. But yeah, so you, to go back to the question, yeah, PhD is not required. It's more about you know how much you publish, how you come across, what you got to bring to the department, what clinical experience you have, what training you've had, that kind of thing. Um. Will a copy of the recording be available to view, please? That's one for you, I guess, Astrid. Uh, yeah, so we are recording it, so it will be available online when we finish the, the meeting, yeah. Brilliant. Um, here we go. What are your, what, you surely motivated me to pursue ophthalmology, brilliant. What are your thoughts on the future of private work in ophthalmology in the UK? Yes, very interesting question. Um, yes, the field is changing in private ophthalmology. I think, um, yeah, it's going to be as probably, I mean, corporates, corporate entities are buying up a lot of private ophthalmic centers. I mean, they, they already run a lot of private hospitals. When I first qualified as a consultant to do private work, I had to work in a private hospital, get privileges and do work there. But I think what will happen is it'll probably move towards private hospitals or entities um, taking on people and paying them accordingly for a sort of a fee for service. So it should be actually be a little bit easier. There are pros and cons. So for example, our unit at OCL Vision, we take on new, new consultants who are interested and we run their practice for them. So secretarial support, billing support. Uh, we mentor them being senior consultants and they quite like that. And then we build them up to a good level and I mean, our, our idea is to try and incentivize them and then um, give them ownership ultimately of their destinies and the practice is our sort of direction. One of the reason why we set up OCL Vision with, with my colleagues is that you get, you know, you, you're a master of your own destiny. And I mean, our idea is to expand. So we've already, we've done London, we've expanded to Elstree. We want to expand a little bit more. So watch this space, but we do want to take people on and give them the opportunity to uh, have a vested interest uh, in their future and also have something tangible that they can sell at the end of their careers. Because right now, uh, previously, you would do your, you would have a career, you finish with the NHS, you get that pension, you finish privately, and that's it. There's nothing. You don't sell, there's nothing to sell. You're not selling anything. Whereas if you're part of an entity, you can then sell your share in the business, and that's another sort of about your retirement taken care of. Hope that kind of answers that, that question. Um, what else have we got here? Thank you for your talk there. Any tips on for building portfolio for SD1? Yeah, again, it's just like, I mean, what I did, I mean, I managed to, I did the exam first, the part one exam. I don't know if that's allowed now, but if you can, that's quite good. Do, do the, at least do the studying for it. Um, and then any sort of eye related course, you can go on, approach your local eye department, see if you can do an observership, sit in clinics, all that kind of thing helps with these CVs. You can do some kind of audit, even if you're doing basic stuff, if you can put that on your on your application, it, it all helps. Um, are there 
love eyes, not very good at suturing signs. Are there any techniques, tips that have helped you? Um, it's just practice, really. I mean, when I did it, I was um, I used to go out of hours and just use the microscope with like a tangerine or some kind of peel, take stitches, and just hours and hours and hours of under the microscope, just getting those hands working. It's all about repetition. Nowadays, you've got virtual simulator uh, that you can practice on. The Royal College have one. They do tutoring courses. A lot of teaching hospitals have their simulators in house. So you can spend time doing that. It's just like it's just like um, like anything else in life, you know. You want to shoot hoops, you got to practice the basketball stuff, you know. It doesn't just come. You do got you got to put the hours in, and the more you put in, the more training you put in, the better you get. Uh, and again, it goes back to that success iceberg. You know, you just see the top. Oh yeah, you can suture in two seconds. You know, why why can I do that? Why can you do that? Because you spent hours, you know, where perhaps others haven't. Um, you know, stayed behind after work, sacrificed, gone to wet labs, done what you needed to do, and just kept at it till you till you cracked it. Um, yeah, I mean that, that's that's that question. Do you think it's possible to get insight regarding whether we'll take to microsurgery, or is it just a case of hoping things work out when we start? Another great question. How do you know if you're going to be any good? It's tough, isn't it? Um, my son likes computer games. And he reckons playing Fortnite gives him hand-eye coordination. <laughs> that may be helpful for the future. So I don't know, if you're good at computer games, does that help you? Maybe. I mean, the thing with microsurgery is that it's a bit like driving. You're looking straight ahead down a microscope and your hands are doing stuff in front of you and your feet are doing stuff as well. Your feet control the microscope, may control like the ultrasound pedal on the Baker machine. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's difficult to know. I mean, you, you need good binocular vision, um, so there's that. But yeah, it's really hard to discern, are you gonna be a good microsurgeon? That's, there's no real easy answer to that. I mean, you could put your hand out and see if you've got a, a shake or not. That's a quite rudimentary test. It's, yeah, it's, there's no easy solution. There's no easy answer for that. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's sort of practical tests you could do, but is it reflective of the real life scenario? Who knows? But like I say, if you're not cut out for surgery, there are other aspects within ophthalmology you can do, which are you know rewarding. Um, okay, so but yes, it's a it's a it is a worry, a worry for everyone who goes into any surgery, any surgical field. You know, you just kind of worry, have I got it? And you will be disillusioned at the early stages because you know you're gonna be you're gonna have setbacks, you're gonna have complications, you know, because you've never done it before. It'll play with your mind. You know, you gotta you gotta really a lot of mental aspect. You've got to be able to work through it, accept it, get up on that horse again, get in there. I mean you're well supported during training. So um that's the real good thing. You know, your senior registrar you get your consultants there with you during the surgery and you've now got simulators which we didn't have before. So it is a lot better. And you've got access to YouTube videos, a whole load of media out there that we didn't have access to kind of prep your mind ready for the surgery. Uh, email again, it's, uh, I'll put it here, I'll put it in the chat. It's just ali at oclvision.com. That's my email, so feel free to email me if you wish for any other questions for the recording. We'll make it available online on our social media. Excellent, brilliant. Yes, please uh, let me know when it's done. I'll, I'll post it as well, share the, um, Share the link on my socials. Will do, yeah. You guys have a YouTube channel? We do, but maybe we should make one, yeah. Otherwise, I'm happy to put it on mine and, and okay. reference you guys. Let me know. Uh, how do you go about revising for the ophthalmology exams? Any good resources to learn about ophthalmology content? Yeah, so the part one is tough. Um, I had a study colleague, so we kind of did it together. Uh, I found the ocular anatomy pretty hard. I mean, it's quite intense. You know, you think as a medical student, you learn as, you know, the cornea, the retina, the lens, you know, but when you go to ophthalmology, you learn the cornea has five layers, each with different function. Retina has 10 layers, each with different function, et cetera, et cetera. It goes into quite minute detail. Then you're going to learn all the pathways of the nerves, all the muscles, what they all do. I mean, it is, it is fascinating. 
but it's a lot of work now. I mean, again, there's more resources now. You've got, you've got 3D animations you can look at for anatomy. We had Snell's ocular anatomy back then. Um, the other thing I found useful, we had a what's called anatomy coloring book. I don't know if you guys have heard of those, but you get a, you get a coloring book for anatomy, ocular anatomy, and whereby you color the pathways of the nerves, for example. And for some reason, that kind of helps you to remember. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that kind of worked for me. And then just testing with colleagues and things as a whole little well resource out there nowadays. Uh, okay, next question. Out of interest, what were the never events that you mentioned earlier in the talk? Okay, yeah, they were specific to cataract surgery. So when you do cataract surgery, you take out the natural lens, you leave the lens capsule behind, and you have to put a lens in the old capsule. Now that lens is calculated for each patient. So we do measurements, we work out that lens power, we choose a lens power and we put it in, in the eye. So we shouldn't really get that wrong. So uh, that so never events are, are situations where you shouldn't really, it, there should be enough steps in place to prevent a, that kind of problem occurring. So in ophthalmology, putting a wrong lens implant is, is classed as a never event. It's similar to like if you operate on the wrong eye or the wrong foot or take a kidney out, you know, that you're not supposed to, that is a never event. So that, that's defined, I think it's Department of Health, Health Education and then, uh, the NHS. So um, yeah, for us, it was, uh, we had several instances where the wrong lens was put in, which then resulted in a bad outcome for the patient. And that means more surgery, potentially taking the lens out, and replacing it. Um, so that, yeah, that, that those were the never events that we were we were dealing with. And the way we dealt with that was, Basically, you just got to put a system and process in place. So we did something called the lens selection sheet. So you, you wipe down the lens power on that sheet. You make sure it matches with the measurements before. And before you operate on a patient, everyone in the operating room goes through that sheet. So, you know, as part of the timeout who checklist, we check the lens power. So what are we putting in this patient? We're putting in a 20 adapter lens. Here's the, uh, uh, the calculation sheet, the biometry. It matches with that matches with the patient, it matches with the eye we do. Thank you very much. We put that one lens in the operating room and that's the only lens there. And since we did that, we didn't, we didn't have any other never events afterwards related to, uh, to wrong implants. Um, another question here. Thank you for sharing. Were there any pivotal significant experiences prior to entering formal ophthalmic training that are throwing your decision and interest in ophthalmology? Um, I would say, it was a bit of the disillusionment uh, with my house jobs. So I finished medical school, as you guys will. Then you come into the, the big bad world. Uh, I did respiratory medicine and I did general surgery and neurology were my, were my house jobs. So for general surgery, I mean, I just didn't enjoy doing PRs. You know, you're going to put your finger up the, you know, I mean, that's just part of the job. You've got to do that. I just didn't like that. Uh, the surgery, I mean, I held a retractor back for hours. It was smelly. Didn't like that. Uh, my boss at the time said, come to the clinic. Come and have a look, see what I do. The consultant, so he was there putting sigmoidoscopes on people's backsides. And I didn't really enjoy that. And that kind of you know, put me off completely um, from getting surgery. With urology, you've got to put catheters in people's anatomy, didn't enjoy that. I just, I just didn't like it. You know, I just, I just hated it actually. I was really sort of thinking I made the wrong choice here, uh, doing medicine. Uh, and then, uh, then that's why I did casualty. And that was more interesting, but you know, the shift work is, is I mean, that is full on. If you've ever done attachment casualty, you're doing, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours and it's full on morning to evening all the way. And I just, uh, you know, do I really want to be in my, 40s, 50s, you know, married with kids and on the shop floor at night, you know, and stuff like that. I just, you know, it really, again, that really disillusioned me. And I was actually to the point where I was looking at a career change. I was thinking of doing management consultancy or some kind of occupational health. I remember looking at a, an ad to work for British Airways as their occupational health consultant. Um, but thankfully, it was actually in casualty, the pivotal moment where I just... I remember looking at any eye complaint that would come in. I actually enjoyed looking at it, looking at them and just seeing the pathology. And I liked the fact that it was so visual. I liked the fact that you didn't have to get a whole lot of blood tests. You didn't need x-rays, MRIs, you know? 
um, it was pretty clean. You don't have to undress anyone. You don't get your hands dirty. It was, it seemed pretty, um, you know, I don't know, it just seemed very nice. And then when I spoke to the ophthalmologists for advice, they were always really friendly, really, you know, good vibes coming from them. Just had a generally good feeling. And I thought, well, you know what? I don't know much about it, but I like it enough to give it a go. And my decision was, you know what? I'm going to give it a go. And if I don't make it, then I'll probably change careers. Uh, but thankfully, I got in. And when I started doing it, I just realized it was like a epiphany. You know, I thought, this is it. This is what I was trained to do. This is what I love. I'll never look back. Never question anything. Love the training. Yes, there were difficult times. You will face difficult times. But I just enjoyed all the learning, learning about some specialties. I love the travel component. Um, it was, um, yeah, I love the surgery. Um, but yeah, so it's a journey, but it's an enjoyable journey. And even as a consultant, I've loved that as well. You know, it had its own challenges. Being a director role, you're going to deal with uh, colleagues, management, 26 consultants to manage. It was challenging. Setting up in a clinic, that was challenging. So I'm at that a different phase of your career. You just go through different different phases every time but yeah so the um decision yeah so that was the affirmation i suppose or, or during casualty kind of gave me the the uh the nod and then i pursued it and then never looked back um are there any other questions <laughs> Um, that looks like it's done. Um, excuse my sore throat voice. Um, I'll send out the feedback form to you all. Um, oh, sorry, there's one more question. I was reading something that currently there is a shortage of ophthalmology consultants. Do you see this being tackled in the future in some capacity? Um, yeah, I mean, they're trying to get more trainees through. Um, yeah, so hopefully more of you guys do it. We will plug that gap. Uh, there's always work in ophthalmology because everyone's living longer and everyone gets cataracts, you know, you live long enough, you always get a cataract, you know, so 65, how many, 7, 88 million people in this country, that's a lot of work out there. That's just cataract surgery, let alone all the other stuff. So, um, yeah, we need you guys in ophthalmology, trained up, ready to go, ready to fire when the time comes. One of you probably be doing my cataract. And there's one more question. Uh, what's the AI tech side of Ofta looking like? Uh, it's looking amazing. That's another real uh, uh, amazing aspect of ophthalmology. It just gets better and better every year. So uh, in terms of the lenses we use, for example, in cataract surgery, we can now use bionic type lenses, which correct for far and near. So they can give you distance as well as reading vision, get people out of their glasses. There's various varieties of those. Laser vision correction, that's an amazing bit of technology. The lasers have got faster, the whole thing's safer. You can correct someone's vision literally in 10 minutes. Um, it's arguably safer than contact lenses these days. Um, then, and then the other tech in terms of getting lenses out of the eye, uh, ultrasound technology, that's become incredible. And the other real big jump is imaging. So the imaging now is incredible. So you can take pictures of pretty much every aspect of the eye, the measurements are, are awesome. Someone's talked about the AI, uh, someone mentioned AI, artificial intelligence, that's coming into ophthalmology as well. So in our private clinic, we're using, actually even in the NHS, we're using artificial intelligence to determine the appropriate lens power for individuals. We can also use it now to uh, advise on diabetic retinopathy, how often the patient should come back, what treatment they need, and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a it's a great space and yeah we, we love our tech in eyes there's a lot of tech a lot of imaging a lot of tech involved with the surgery so if you are techie it does feed that side of you okay it doesn't seem like there's many more questions um people are saying thanks <laughs> So guys, is there any anything else you want to ask? Okay. So thank you so much for the talk. Um, you've inspired a lot of people today, me included. <laughs> yeah. Um, would um, 
Are you going to send out the feedback form, Sona? And then uh, yeah, it'll get emailed to everybody. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And we would appreciate if you could fill them. Um, yeah. yeah. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank Brilliant. you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Hope Thank that you. was helpful. Thank you. It was really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.